We start with Catherine Richardson. Catherine is a professor in biological oceanography and leader of Sustainability Science Center in Copenhagen and co-author, as I just said, of this report. She will present the report and her take on the role of science. So, uh, now over to Catherine in Copenhagen. This report was written some time ago, you remember back in 2019, when most of us haven't heard about pandemics. And, and I would like to ask you if you could promise to us to include in your presentation something of how the pandemic, what we know now, would have impacted on some of the recommendations. So can you say that you will touch upon that? Because I think that's, very, that's something that we all wonder about. So, yes. Kat, you will. Great. I will be very happy to. <laughs> great. Great, Catherine. Over to you. Okay, thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today, and I'm delighted that you use this report as a starting point. I'm sorry we have to meet this way, but there are also advantages to meeting this way. I guess there's probably more of us here together than we would have been otherwise, and I do find it easier to focus on, on, the, on the computer doing it this way than sitting in, a, in an auditorium with a computer on my lap or I'm doing emails at the same time. So there's also some good news that we have here. I should also add, I'm trying still to learn how to work all this. And, and Yan mentioned it was a very special day. He meant it was a special day because we have, we have this meeting. But in fact, it's also Yan's birthday. And I've been looking for an icon that you can actually mark his birthday with. I can't find it. But I'm sure with your, um, the initiative that's out there in all of you, some of you will be able to find an icon in order to be, or even even sing later today for, for Yan because it's his birthday. The other thing I'd like to mention before I get started is the fact that I'm a control freak and I really like handling my own slides, but I've been talked out of it this time. So let's see how this is going to go. With respect to the COVID and, and our report, I honestly don't believe we would have done anything differently. What COVID does is it shows how important some of the conclusions we came up with were. For example, we argued that the world is interconnected. You can't ignore what's happening other places. And we argued that we have an unsustainable relationship with nature and we even mentioned animal born diseases we mentioned the, the, the multidimensional aspects of inequality and argued that everyone should have access to, to, health, uh, 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 to health care. And, and we, we also um, we identified different levers, including, including um, individual and collective behavior in terms of addressing transitions. And OK, maybe not in Sweden, but in most places, people recognize that using masks, face masks, is an important lever in terms of dealing with, with this disease. So, and, and, and finally, finally, we do actually have a statement in there somewhere that says something along, along the lines of that many of the goals can be addressed at local and national levels, but there are issues that transcend national frontiers. And we mentioned flooding, pollution, and disease outbreak there. So, so I actually think we set the scene perfectly for, um, for a COVID pandemic and our, our uh, recommendations, we would have mentioned, of course, the pandemic, but our recommendations wouldn't have been any different. So with those words, let me go in and tell you a little bit about our recommendations when it comes to science. Next slide, please. Most people believe that sustainable development is really a question of helping the thems on this planet become just like us. They think the world is divided, as you can see on this slide, that is there, there are, in our part of the world, we have very few children and most of them survive. In other parts of the world, they have many, many children, but very many of them die. In fact, those of you who have read Rosling's Bobo on fact Factfulness will recognize the fact that these are old data. This is data from 1965. What does it look like today? Next slide, please. It looks more like this. And you can see there isn't an us and a them any longer. Next. 
And you can see that this is why we need science. This is it brings us data to make good decisions. You make better decisions about sustainable development if you understand that it isn't a question of us and them, that we're all becoming very equal here. But next, this equality comes with some externalities. In the upper left-hand corner here, we have inequalities. And the yellow columns are showing inequalities between countries. And you can see that's being reduced. But I showed that in the last slide. The red is inequalities between people. And I think at the moment we're something like 18 people own as much as the bottom 50% of the people on this planet. Or it's maybe the numbers aren't exactly right, but there's something like that. In the upper right hand corner, we look at, um, at, at groups, uh, extinctions within different animal groups um, over time, coming from the last IPBIS report. And the lower panel shows the risk of, of crossing tipping points with increasing global temperature. The black line at the bottom is the temperature over on the earth for the last 10,000 years. The, the vertical or the horizontal pink line is what we're aiming at with the, the Paris Convention and the, the columns there show different, the risks of when we think the risks of crossing tipping points come in. And you see, even if we, even if we maintain and we meet the goals of the Paris agreement, so we run the risk of, of five tipping points um, being crossed. West Antarctic ice sheet, Greenland ice sheet, um, the, the Arctic sea ice, alpine glaciers, and, and losing coral reefs. In fact, we're pretty sure we're going to lose coral reefs. Next. And, and we've in science, we've been very good at describing these externalities. But the question is whether we also can use our science in order to be able to manage these externalities. Next, please. We see here, um, I think, a picture that, that changed the way people think about their relationship with this planet. We can clearly see that the Earth doesn't have an umbilical cord. That means that once we've used the Earth's resources and take, you know, make no mistake, we get rich using the Earth's resources. Once we've used the Earth's resources, we're not going to get any more. So managing our relationship with the planet as a whole actually challenges our reductionist way of of, of doing research that we've been doing since the days of Newton. It's as if we believe that if we take all of the details in the geology department and all of the research details worked out by the people in physics and all of them by the people in economics and all of the people in, in, in health science and put them into a big pot and stir them up, we'll understand how the earth works. Well, we won't. That would be like asking any a doctor who's an expert in, in, in brains and in hearts and in stomachs and in reproduction and in feet and in bones, asking them to put all their knowledge together. Would we understand what a person is? No, of course we wouldn't, because we don't, it's the interactions between those parts that actually makes a person. And it's the interactions between the disciplines that we work with that actually makes the earth what it is. Next, please. So we need to focus on, on, on focus our research on understanding these interactions. Now, as I noted, we've had this picture. I'm sure you've seen this picture of the earth. It's, it's, I've been told it's the most downloaded from the net. And we've had it since the late 1960s, where we clearly can see that the Earth's resources are limited. And yet, it wasn't until 2015 that we got an international agreement that acknowledges the fact that our resources are limited. Next, please. And that agreement is the Sustainable Development Goals. It's Agenda 2030 with its attached to Sustainable Development Goals. And, and you can say that these goals are, in fact, a vision for how we want to share the Earth's resources among what is soon to be nine to 10 billion people and all other living organisms on this planet. Next. The other thing you can say about this is that there's nothing new on that list. We knew way before 2015 that we had challenges in all of those boxes. And in fact, we had UN agreements on women, uh, health, uh, biodiversity, climate, peace, water. So we had, we had FN, UN agreements for many of these issues. What's so special about the Sustainable Development Goals? What's special is they're brought into a single framework. 
And that means it's no longer the goals that are really interesting. It's the interactions between them that are coming into focus. And in order to be able to, to support sustainable development, we need to understand those interactions. Next, please. And that means we have to, we have to move our research if it's gonna support sustainable development from our disciplinary or sector thinking to system thinking. So we bring it all together. Now, I just said it's important to look at the, at the goals together, and I'm going to break them apart. Next, please. Because we in our group last year actually did go in and try and look at how we were doing on all of the goals. And I think you have to do that in order to be able to examine the interactions between them. What we found out was that there are some of the goals, at least there were before COVID-19, that we were pretty much on track to meet. But some of them, not only were not on track to meet them, and not that they were, were being level, but the trend is in the wrong direction. Now let's look at how the, the various, the, the status of how we are doing on these goals differs with the different goals. Next, please. You can see on the left-hand side, the green column is the one that tells us that we're within, if you were on track to get within 5% of the goal itself. And those are things like infant mortality. We really do not like dead babies and their mothers are going to live too. And we're going to get these children into school. At least we were on track to do so before COVID. If you go a little bit farther down and say 10%, then we're the, the hungriest people, we're going to make sure they have food. We're going to eradicate um, extreme poverty. We're going to get young people to read. Um, so there's lots of really people oriented goals that we're on track to meet. Where are the ones that we are, where the trend is in the wrong direction? Next, please. They're the ones out to the right. And the ones out to the right, the one all the way up at the top is um, about nutrition. And it's not because, it's not because people aren't going to get enough to eat. It's because very many people are getting too much or the wrong food. And we have an obesity epidemic that's, that's just over the entire world. It's also inequalities between people. They're still, they're still increasing. It's about our ecological footprint. It's about climate and it's about biodiversity. Now, why should we worry? If things are getting so much better for people, why should we worry that out on the right-hand side, we have a negative, um, we have a negative trend? Next slide, please. Well, that's because we get rich, we increase at the bottom of this slide. I can't point when we do it this way, but the bottom level there, those are the people oriented goals. Um, and they come with a cost at the, of the global commons. And that's the up above where we have biodiversity and climate are basically proxies for, for our, our, the environmental resources or the, the, the earth's resources. So we, we, get our, we get rich, we improve our, our well-being by using the Earth's resources. So sustainable development is found somewhere in that arrow between those two poles. Now, we don't know exactly where we want to be, but we do know that if we're too close to, and up protecting the, the environment, then there isn't room for humanity to develop. On the other hand, if we're too far down and focusing on humanity, we risk losing the, the, we risk losing the, the, um, the natural capital, the currency that's paying for the party. And we all know that you can, you, can, um, you can party even if the balance in your bank account is on its way down, but you can't do it indefinitely. And that's our problem here. We can't talk about sustainable development because this cannot continue sustainably or this cannot continue into the future as far as we can see. And goal number 10, which is about sharing, it's about equity, it's about uh, equality between people, is of course central here because how are we going to share the goals or share the, the resources on this earth with nine to 10 billion people? You will note that none of the rest of the goals are, are, are pictured here. That is because, next slide please, all of them can be, all of them can be, um, put in one or more of the four levers we identify in order to be able to release the pressure to, to make us use our the natural resources more efficiently. And those four, four levers are science and technology, but that can't do it alone. It's 
changing our economic system. It's our using our economic system, using our governance system and our own behavior. Now, next, we don't really think, and this is a good way of thinking about the goals, but in our daily lives, we don't think about the goals. Can we translate this to something we understand? Next slide, please. Of course we can. Um, you have the goals that are people oriented at the bottom. You have the nature goals in the top. Now they're actually divided into biodiversity, land, ocean, and atmosphere. And then we have, we uh, increase our, our well being by getting energy, by getting food, by getting water, by getting materials for production and infrastructure and so on. And all of those activities either take things directly out of the global commons, those are the green area, arrows, or they put something in, waste in, those are the black arrows. And, and the black, three black arrows you see going out to atmosphere, that's climate. Those are waste products that we're putting into the atmosphere. But there's lots of other waste that we're putting out there, which is just as important. Next slide, please. So the really important thing here, and if we want to, want to deal with and we want to achieve sustainable development, is to focus on these arrows and to, next, focus on these arrows, yes, and, and to, to our goal has to be to maximize the societal value or the increase in our welfare at the same time minimizing our use of the natural resources. Next slide, please. And we in the report identify six different entry points. We say everything is connected together, but we identify six different entry, entry points where a transformation is needed. Transformation is plan change. We don't just develop a car and say, oh, well, let's see where that takes us. We go out and say, okay, we know we have limited resources. We know our food system is using too many resources. We can't just upscale it to feed nine to 10 billion people. How does it need to be changed? How can we get it there? That's a planned transition or transformation. So we identify six different entry points. It's about people, it's about the economic system, the energy system, the food system, our relationship to the global commons and so on. And then we next use the four levers that we have and show how they can be used. They all have to be used together. And I'll show you, I mean, I can tell you, it's so clear they need to be used together because you know, now, for example, the politicians in the EU said, we want cars to drive longer per liter. Fine. So technology, which is the, you know, the science and technology went in to make cars that go longer per liter. In Denmark, we then reduced the cost of cars, which meant that people bought more cars. And the end result is that there's more CO2 coming from cars than before we increased the, the, the mileage on cars. So you need to use these levers together. Now, um, we need to think, next slide please, we need to think our research into this matrix and, and how does our research contribute to these transformations. And actually at the University of Copenhagen right now, we are plotting our, our, um, all of our research, our relevant research into this matrix so you can go into our website and see how we contribute. And this is because, next slide please. We know that if we if we just focus on on solving single problems, this can often lead to other problems or other challenges other places. Next slide, please. And here you see a matrix that that shows or two matrices where uh, you know you have this is what's well known and you know where there's much agreement and, and you go in next I can't read it the way it's presented so just put it up. And, and the point is that in order to deal with, with um, sustainability or sustainability issues, we really need to focus on these wicked problems and very little research focuses there now. In order to do this, next slide, we need to focus, oops, next, next slide, yes. Um, we need to focus on developing sustainability science. Now, what is that? Next. It addresses all, um, or it, it, it draws on all scientific disciplines. Next, it uses a problem solving approach. Next, it seeks to shed light on, on complex or wicked problems. Next, it can help tackle the trade offs that will always be there. I mean, every time you do something positive on the, on the list of SDGs, there will also be a negative effect and we have to try and reduce that negative effect. Next. 
Um, it's, uh, it, it's working, uh, involves uh, working with affected groups and peoples. And the final, final um, point, uh, next, yes, okay. Um, and it fosters science policy interface with joint creation for planning, managing, and decision-making. So this is the kind of science that we really need. Next slide, please. There are different ways that research can be, can be linked to the SDGs. And, and the first and the simplest way, and the way that we all do it at the moment is to say at the end of our application or the end of our paper, and this study could be important for SDG number 14 or whatever happens to be our favorite SDG. In fact, we can use the SDGs. We can actually go in and try and and the, the 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 conflicts that we try and aim our research. Put it, you know, not that anyone should be telling us what to do in our research, but for years we've been trying to encourage um, encourage scientists to do work which is relevant for innovation. Um, why not try and 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 encourage ourselves and our colleagues to do research that can be relevant for sustainable development. Next slide, please. At the moment, very few of us get any farther than saying this could be relevant. There are, we can, inter, we can actually, next, we can actually use the SDGs as a compass for, for, for managing, our, um, uh, managing our research, or for doing our research. And this is my, my, my final slide when we work on it here. This shows, it comes from our report, it actually shows the, the research and development investment which is made globally in 2015. You will immediately note that there are very big holes here. And, and, and those Catherine, big holes, Catherine, just, yes. a, just a friendly reminder, about two more minutes. So you're- Yes, well, yeah. I'm, I'm actually, this is my last slide, I'm finishing it. Um, this is very big holes. There are very big holes on this, and that makes a difference. For example, here in Denmark, we're still researching how to make cows give more milk. Our cows give up to over 40 liters per day and on average 26 liters per day. In Africa, a cow has an average daily production of seven liters. Where does sustainable development need research to make cows give more milk? Um, the, the, the red on this shows that this is, this is money given by, by business and, and businesses and much of the public money given to research is also given um, to, they don't focus on interactions, they focus on the things. They are not focusing on things that are relevant for sustainable development. So now three, just hit the thing three times. So basically my conclusion, hit it three times, yeah. My conclusion is that very little research is guided by interests that are, or much of the research is guided, um, that it, it conflicts with sustainable development. There's little public and, and almost no private um, money being invested in, in, um, in uh, interact, looking at interactions. And um, there, th there's global inequality here. So next. We can use the sustainable development goals as a compass for our research. And if you want to see more, we actually published a paper in Nature Sustainability about the problems with science and sustainable development last year. Next. And I would I would argue that you could have a look at that. So that was my that was mine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much for a very inspiring and uh, the global picture uh, what what what's we have at stake but also looking at where where do we move as scientists where what what do we need to to consider when we develop new research idea when we reflect on who should we collaborate with if we want to address this uh, the challenges that you are pointing us to so thank you so much for that i hear from Mikael Lösblom here in the chat who's following the chat that there is a question on and that's a very uh, <clears throat> that's a tough one catherine how do we properly address the conflict between the goals and the targets well, 
first of all, there are conflicts between the goals and the targets. And, and that, I mean, we're very often as scientists, we like to analyze the SDGs as an academic piece of work. It's not an academic piece of work. It's a political negotiation that resulted here. Um, so I think we have to take the, 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 the targets and the goals as, as uh, a political vision or a political goal and not be completely um, sidetracked by the fact that some of them are incompatible. But sustainable development will always be a compromise. It will be a compromise between positive and negative effects. And that's what I tried to say, that, that we need to use our research to try and find pathways where you can, you can balance the positive and negative. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that you had uh, if I understood it right, at, at your department or that, that you have categorized, you use this matrix from the report to guide your research. When you look at uh, maybe other academic institutions in Denmark and in the Nordic countries, what do you think are the, what are the recommendations in the report? Do you, th do you really think that Nordic countries need to work on? Can you say that something is different uh, than from what's just being put out in the global report? So I would say, first of all, we don't guide our research with that matrix, but we try and present it to the outside world. So we ask our scientists to say, my research is relevant because it contributes to the transition in this way. So we're trying to get scientists to think that way. Actually, I think what's really important in the Nordic countries is that we are very silo thinking. We are very, very, um, in, our, in our, our sort of Humboldtian approach to, to science, we're, we're, we're very much in our own um, disciplines. And, and I think we need to, we need to exercise um, and, and train in being able to work um, across the disciplines and focus on interactions. Is that something that you, in your closest environment where you work, that, uh, what do you do to encourage this? Can you work with incentives or how, how do you make, how do you break out of the silos? Do you have anything to share from? The university has, well, first of all, we have our sustainability science center, which is not a research center that is focused in, in one department or one faculty. It is a cross university infrastructure that, that has, a, has a, um, a steering committee with representatives from all of the different faculties. And it tries to create a network of, of uh, scientists across the university, both for teaching and for research that focus on, on sustainability. And this whole exercise is, is anchored at the rectorate. Um, so, so this is a, a cross university initiative, which is trying to bring um, uh, both education and research uh, together in this way. But okay. it, you know, it's hard. We're working against a tradition that started in 1400 and white yeah, cabbage. Yeah. So. <laughs> One step at a time. But there yeah. is also this transformation need and this decade of action uh, on our shoulders. Uh, I also get a question here from the chat. If you could reflect on the need for innovation in an energy constrained world. Yes, I think what's really interesting is um, that people go around and say that technology has, has saved us before it will save us again. And I think what technology, um, I think the reason we have this perception that technology has saved us before is that our, our, um, our development was limited by access to, to, to workforce and to infrastructure. And in, in both, you know, now we're 7.8 billion people. We don't have a, we have plenty of working people and we've got, We've got plenty of infrastructure most places. So what's limiting us at the moment is, is resources. And so innovation has to be focused on ensuring that we actually use innovation to use our resources more efficiently. And until now, most innovation has actually ended up with getting more people getting access to resources and therefore we are using more resources. Okay. So we have to, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you for presentation and thank you for, uh, for uh, the Q&A session and we hope to have you remaining in the meeting. But